Welcome ASLers to the next scenario that we have going on in the war room. Here we have Operation S67 Besieged. This will be a slightly different game than the two previous games that we covered. This is pretty much a bug hunt for lack of a better word. Uh, the fortunate thing about it are the scenario special rules are very simple. The victory conditions seemingly are simple. One thing you have to make sure you understand for the victory conditions we will cover. And um, the units are very simple. Uh, interestingly enough, we have an 8 plus 1 in the Japanese OB. And we have a giant 10 minus 2 in the American OB. We do not have raiders. These are going to be Merrill's Marauders. As you'll see, they will, of course... Um, probably come on the board like they always do and um, but let's get to the scenario card and try to decipher what's going on all right uh i don't know how to pronounce this but let's go Pumga, burma 31st of march 1944 by the fourth day of fighting of Pumga, the japanese had completely surrounded the second battalion of the 5307th Composite Unit Provisional, popularly, popularly known as Merrill's Marauders, the 3rd Battalion's morning patrol from Samshinyang encountered a strong Japanese trail block about 400 yards north of the 2nd Battalion's perimeter at Pumga. The patrol tried to break through but finally had to withdraw back to Samshinyang Colonel George McGee then decided to break the trail block from Pumga and carefully thinned out his perimeter to form a strike force. So, another half board scenario. So, this would be nice and tight. North is the arrow there. Hopefully, we have the orientation correct. Let's check out the victory conditions down the bottom right hand side, bottom left hand side. Awesome picture, by the way, of the uh, scenario. Americans win at game end if there are no Japanese units on or adjacent to the X road hexes and they exit four victory points or more off the north edge on between HO and J0. Each squad's worth your typical two, half squad one, leaders are worth one point plus one point per negative modifier. So, one thing to note explicitly in this particular one. No Japanese units. Does it ask the condition of those units? Do they have to be good order? Do they have to be unbroken? Hmm? Doesn't say. Therefore, it doesn't matter. They have to be no Japanese units. Broken, unbroken, good order, in melee, anywhere. Anywhere near the exit road. So that's going to be an interesting um, dilemma. So let's go down here further. Of course, the Japanese set up first, as we always have so far. Americans move first. Uh, Japanese have a very, very, very small force, but what they do have are a couple of elite units, which means their morale is going to be actually higher than their leaders if they're stacked with a leader. A couple of 447s, remember, step production's big. 228 for the medium, 808 plus one. I'm going to probably go over what this guy might be used for in this scenario. You say, Stu, 8 plus 1 liter, liters garbage. Well, in this case, he kind of negates the morale level bonus of the units. Uh, because he'll give them a morale level bonus, but if they're subject to a morale check, they have to add one. So, um, medium machine gun, he is used good in close combat. You do not have to use the leadership modifier in close combat. So, you could just add his strength value. I love the... Uh, Icon, medium two lights mortar. I mean, that's about as regurgitated as you can be in the Japanese. 
but there's only five units. What do we have down here different for the Americans? Well, and ELR is usually always four for the Japanese. ELR five for the Americans. They are not underscored. Note they are not underscored. Big difference. So check your rule book. When uh, underscored, when non-underscored units, they will step reduce. So nine, essentially almost double the Japanese force, a giant 10 minus two liter, nine minus one liter, just there to, to abide by a situation. Two eight zeros and a medium. All right, so what do you think the two eight zeros are to be used for in this scenario? Primarily, right off the bat. First of all, you have four liters for nine squads. That's about a liter for every other squad. So the first thing that should come to mind to you is what? Mobility. There's units here, stack them two. Remember, a lot of times we'll have dense jungle. So if you stack one liter with two guys, that centrally little patrol force can haul ass, go very fast. So you essentially have four sets or groups of six, six, sevens and leaders with a three smoke making capability that can haul ass through the forest at six movement factors. On the top, the Japanese only have two leaders. So for, if they wanted to run away for, from you or to you, they'd have to be stacked with the leaders, which they might not want to do because you need to eliminate all their units. Um, therefore, most likely they're not going to clump together at least theoretically. So it's going to be easy to run down the sing the multi-man counters with your mobility of your leaders. Meaning machine guns just thrown in there for good measure so it doesn't look too boring of a uh, of a uh, section. Special rules. These are going to be really simple this time, guys. PTO terrain is in effect, period. What does that mean? What does that mean, PTO is in effect? It means all jungle is dense. Okay? But they go ahead and do this thing here. Interior jungle hexes. Hexes bordered by all six hex sides by jungler bamboo. Blah, blah, blah. Same old crap we've had from the other scenarios. Are dense jungle. All other jungle hexes are light jungle. Why not just say PTO terrain is in effect, um, light jungle is in effect, interior jungle hexes are dense. I mean, it's the same thing, but instead of saying all jungle is dense, let's turn all other non-interior jungles light jungle. Just say PTO terrain is in a uh, light jungle is in effect, interior jungle hexes are instead dense jungle. That way you can kind of just get rid of that whole last section. I, I guess it's kind of saying the same thing, but it's just it's just backing backing the light jungle into the rules. So not really a big fan. I mean, a little bit verbose. Japanese hip is NA. What does that mean? That means normally the Japanese have 10% of their force. In this case, rounded up would be like one squad equivalent would be uh, hidden initially placed. So at that point, the Americans would practically have to cover every single hex pretty much on the board because what do you notice of the turn record? What do you notice of the turns that we haven't had in the other sections? Japanese sets up first, Americans move first. So who moves second? Japanese move second. What are the victory conditions? Americans win a game in if there are no Japanese units on adjacent to the road hexes. Okay. So what it means is the Americans must completely secure the area. And if there are any Japanese left over, maintain a force strong enough to keep them from getting to one of these locations, which it's you'll see it on the map in just a moment. So the Japanese actually have a last turn, turn six in this scenario. The key thing is 
this a plus one I'll describe to you is part of that last turn six. All right. So other special rules, good order Americans are considered Raider multi-man counter for purposes of determining ambush. So even though these are not Raider units per se, as noted as their, as their designation, they are much stronger than Raiders because they have six firepower and six range. The range isn't going to be much of a factor here, but the morale factor is lowered. You notice the seven morale factor, easier to break. So, so if they get into close combat, the Japanese player might consider even more firing into close combat to break these units. So not a lot of leadership modifiers, but the 10 minus two is a big boy. Big boy, 10 minus two. So let's check it out. Uh, let's go to the map and we'll go over some of our strategies for this particular game. All right, here's the map. And this is from the American's perspective. North is going up. Our exit hex is our H0, which is right here. I'll go ahead and mark it. Let's go H0, I, and J. The Americans have to exit four victory points off these three hexes. One thing you might think about, as the Japanese, let's say the Americans are fighting and they're just kind of being busy around the map. They got a couple units here, 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 and here. And it's getting late in the game. They got just a couple, like a small entourage that can actually kind of make it off. One thing you might consider are there are two types of victory conditions in this, in this game, right? You've got the exit victory conditions and the, and the clearing the Japanese out from what you see here as, quote, the old road locations. So they could clear you out. But if they don't exit anybody, they lose. And if they exit people early enough, then they might not have enough guys to make sure you're cleared out. So that's kind of the trick. Um, theoretically, the end game will simply just be them running off the map uh, because they have to clear you out from the top area anyway. They have to clear you from here. So that's got to occur prior to the end of the game. Right, theoretically, unless they just unless there's a there's a multi-man counter here and they jump in close combat, that just depends on how the game develops. But um, these are the uh, before the road was eliminated. This was the road that's on the map, and it goes down like this. And I think it always go, it also goes like this, right? But this part over here, we're not worried about. This is the part that they designated in this scenario. So theoretically, this is the old road. I marked, I removed the roads because it's PTO. And so what I did is I marked those areas with Japanese essentially quote control markers. Nice small, small control markers I use in Vazel. And this makes it easier to identify the hexes without circling them, so on and so forth. So there's a good amount of area that the Japanese can be in. Some of it's open ground, a lot of it's jungle. Note that all of it, all of it, except for two hexes, is light jungle. Which means when you do deal with combat, like these units over here, let's zoom in a little bit. All the Japanese units here, both of these units can combine for fire group. All of these units can combine for a fire group right? They're not restricted by the dense jungle. Both units are not going to be in the dense jungle. Again, the dense jungle is delineated by the green line we did last time. So there's only a couple spots of, of dense jungle. We've got one hex here, three here, three there, five or six, uh, six here, and about six here, two and three, six, six over there. So um, I think the biggest impact will be the ones right here in the middle just in terms of uh, stacking cap capabilities and things like that. So as a Japanese defender, let me uh, go ahead and swing this map around. I spread my units out thinking that if I spread the units out, 
then the Americans have to send small groups, small little platoons, to deal with each group, right? So we've got a unit over here. And again, I split my leaders up to act like so he doesn't know which ones are leaders. He could probably tell. Um, he could probably tell pretty easily, to be honest with you, because you have four support weapons, right? You'll you'll see the stacks of the of the concealment stacks here, and so on and so forth. So if you look at it, it's like, well, is and and can and support weapons can't be concealed by themselves. I can't set that up over there and conceal it. That's not legal. If that were set up by itself, it would just simply be there. So we have to set them up like this. And so most likely a leader is not going to be using a support weapon. So theoretically, all the units in the middle are given away. Um, one of these units is most likely a leader. And so to be honest with you, um, either two of these guys are leaders or one of these guys is leaders and then this is the leader. So theoretically, that's not a very good setup now, is it? But that's the one I'm going to go with. Because this A plus one, doesn't matter whether he knows he knows it's a, it's a leader or not, because he has to come get him. Because if he doesn't come get him, send, send like a shock troop up in this general direction, maybe comes around this way, and pursues Mizumo. Mizumo just simply moves forward. And ends up here at the end of the game. So then he has to chase him down, which is not getting near the exit victory conditions until he can catch and kill Mizumo. Right? So I can try to occupy multiple units because I have six six movement factors as Mizumo. These units have six movement factors if stacked together. So that's the whole key is they could try to run you down and they will probably be able to do it. So the, the idea is if he wants to fire on these units first, I've got at least four firepower over here. I was debating using the mortar over there, but the reason why I've, I put the mortar here is likely he'll come here to be able to have higher mobility to go down the road. If he doesn't, then what I can do is I can drop smoke at any of these locations at these, at these spots or white phosphorus to hinder his view. So either these units can come this way, like right here, he might be able to see him from this spot. Or if he's over here, he definitely can see him from this spot because these are not dense jungle. These hex sides do not block line of sight. And then I can come down and then join this side over here if, if, if desired. Essentially, this is a victory lo location hex for me there. This is also a victory location hex. So if I stick around over here, and he sends his little shock troops in this general direction. I mean, that's only three squads to two squads. That's not too bad. You know, if he stacks the 10 minus two leader with both of them, that's that's a little stronger. But in that case, we could just try to run from the 10 minus two. Once we figure out where the 10 minus two is, I'm thinking that the Japanese stay away from him and try and kill these eight zeros. If you can kill these eight zeros early, it reduces the Americans' mobility whether he's alone or not, because now these guys really can't chase you through the jungle. So I think that's the key in this one here. The Americans must maintain their mobility, and the Japanese kind of have to do exactly the same thing. They can defend to a certain extent, and that's why I put, you know, 12 firepower plus one attack anywhere here for the 448. And then the medium machine gun is just a harassing fire four firepower attack on these plus one hexes and this guy as well it could be a worse place uh you could switch them uh this is just kind of like a just a general general view of what i'm just going to go with i figure spread them out cover the approaches because the americans if they double time they go one two three four five six seven and they can fire with a plus one. So that can, that's going to be a four plus one on this unit because you're gonna have a nine minus one leader. 
you're going to have counter exhaustion, which is going to counter it. And then you're going to have a plus one from spraying the units in, and he's going to be halved. So this unit is going to be four firepower in the advanced fire phase. This unit will be four firepower in the advanced fire phase. I'm not sure why they're doubled. And then um, uh, he, I might have an extra unit. So that's going to be eight firepower, and that's going to be halved for his concealment. So, but that's a four plus one good shot. If he loses a concealment, then, you know, where's he going to go? He can't go this way. He'll get shot. So he has to go two, four, six, or two, three, four, five. You know, if he goes over here, he could be reached by any unit. So at that point, he'd probably have to come back. And then the Americans can continue the push up, the, the containment up in this area. But if he maintains his concealment, right? And then he decides to go two, three, four, five, six, seven. Advance won't really do him any good. Um, then just one of those Americans would have to go over him, probably kill him. Because he can get there with the leader, two, four, six, and kill him. So you're not really going to get too far away. But if the leaders are broken... You can do that because the squads would go two, four, six, and they'd have to CX to get on you. And um, even at one to six, we even noticed that one to six, that's a four for a uh, close combat for the Japanese. And if they ambush you, that's a five for a casualty reduction. So even this one leader can kill this six, six, six in close combat in hand to hand combat. That'll be a, like a five for casualty reduction. Pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. So, again, that's what we're hoping for is maybe maybe if the Americans come in, split up, and kind of like send out little troops to, to seek and destroy units, that's something that he might consider. Uh, but that's this is the reason why I have my forces right here for the Japanese. Spread them out so maybe he'll come, you know, piecemeal, like one-third, one-third, one-third. So that's the general idea of the Japanese defense. Again, the mortar can also fire in every single one of these woods hexes here in case the Americans make a good push in this direction and then end up in these jungles over here. If these guys end up in these jungles over here, I could probably take a shot and then get out of dodge, you know. One, two, three, four, advance, and then maybe work my way back to the other side or just skulk because he's got to go up and down this is four movement factors if he wants to come this way one two and that would be six up there so that's a lot of movement factors and they have to remain you know unbroken of course right if i could break them they have to rally 10 minus two is the only one going to rally very fast and they have to exit through these small through this small little window sort of like the bridge too from the last game exit through the small window right here okay always something you can think of you if you have lots of units left over you could just win by default by blocking this he won't be able to remove you all from the terrain and he can't exit so but considering the japanese really don't have a lot of units they only have five units and I have them kind of spread out. I think the Americans can hunt them down and kill them. So they're really not going to be able to block this over here per se. And four victory points is pretty easy to get off. But we do need to we do need to be aware that the Americans can make a fast push on this side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, advance. That's why we have a four, four, seven here. So he could fire on units that might want to go in this way in the first turn mind you the americans could just come and exit four points before anything happens and then yeah exit four points before anything happens and then just kill you after that so um well that's why the 447 is over here on the side is to guard these open ground hexes for a quick quick dash and the same thing with the 448 here is to stop the quick movement in the open ground. 
just so they don't get behind us and surround us too easily. Make them go through the woods, make him expend movement factors, and uh, try to curtail his movement. Um, I might consider, you know, you might want to consider putting two units over here. All right, that's a much stronger force. You know, this unit still has a line of sight to here. Defending our 8-1 leader. Um, actually, wouldn't be a bad idea. Media machine gun. We really don't need to defend this area right up here. But we could have a 447 over in this general direction. Again, it, 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 it kind of would give away exactly what we're doing here. Um, maybe 447 here. To have a line of sight to H8. You know, uh, because if the Americans come on here, this is the board edge. This is an onboard, essentially onboard. I created an onboard edge here on the outside. So these are hexes that the Americans can't set up on. They have to set up on these outside hexes to come on. But they can move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, advance. So they can get there pretty quickly. And they could be in concealment. But, uh, yeah, I think I will put a 447 here so I can drop residual at this location. And then the four, the machine gun here, shooting here, kind of guarding the quick advance area right here. Maybe for one shot. After a shot, if the 10 minus 2 sets up in G9, he's just going to have a 18 minus 1 shot on this guy. You're just going to end up dying. So you, essentially, you just have to move. And wait for the Americans to move to shoot at them. You can't stand toe to toe with those six six sevens. It's not, it's not going to happen. Not in plus one terrain. So that's the idea. We're going to leave it like that. We are going to move this unit over, and then we're going to try and figure out what the Americans are going to do. All right. So let me double check the uh, OB for the Americans to make sure I didn't set up too many units on board, and then we'll uh, then we'll get ready for gameplay. All right, I did have too many units on the map, on the board for the, for the uh, Americans. They only have nine. I thought, I, I think I put 11 on there. So make sure both players, when you're playing the game, uh, check the OBs. You don't want too many units. You don't want to leave a unit or two off. I've actually kind of probably lost a game or two by not putting on enough units. Like if the Japanese forgot to put on another 447 in this game, then most likely is he's just going to lose because you need every single unit possible. So the uh, Americans have the correct number of units. I think what I'm going to do here is not what I did last game. I think I want to do a concentration in force for the Americans with some quick pincher flanks. So what I think I'm going to do is take um take a large force and we're going to punch straight through here and go after the japanese probably five units definitely five squads on this side and the 10 minus two liter and an eight zero liter to deal with these guys over here maybe six i might consider six units to be taken over there because we're just going to try to annihilate these guys and deal with it as it is. And then the other units will simply go up through here and get real close to the Americans. And we're going to ignore these units back here. So we're going to essentially try to secure a perimeter, see what the Japanese do. And then we're going to come and decimate the units in the middle right just overwhelm them with our american firepower we've got 18 we've got 12 and that's that's in the advanced fire phase if we prep could prep fire these guys at point blank it's over so we're gonna have four uh what we might do is we put might put the medium over with these guys and take one of those six six squads and come over here so because we might need the bodies we just need the firepower we do a static defense over here I mean, essentially, if you put a, a squad right here with the medium machine gun, 
right? And let's say the Japanese leader wants to do his end around bullshit, right? What's he got to go through? Essentially, this 667 in this position here has locked down fire in all the open ground hexes and in these two hexes as well. So for the eight minus one or eight plus one to get to one of these locations, pretty much he has to go this way without taking an eight minus two shot in the face. Okay, even concealed, he'll lose his concealment if he moves out in the open. So those, these avenues are not available to the eight plus one. And we don't want to use two squads in this location here. Right. We'll just use one squad because that way we can make sure we maximize the area of a coverage and area of defending from these victory hexes over here. And the one thing about the Japanese leaders, if you fire on him and he takes a morale check, he immediately checks for a wound to see if he dies because they go into that. And at this point, he only has three movement factors. So it goes one, two, three, and you just chase him down and slaughter him. So the meeting machine gun is essentially just going to be sitting back here for defense against any units that might want to come that direction. All right, and he could be concealed and you won't be able to know who, uh, actually the same thing up here is these are big, Big counters when you're playing face-to-face. -face. Actually, I just reduced them so you can see the units. So technically, he doesn't know where the leaders are. So just keep that in mind that these counters should be. So there could be a squad and a leader there, squad and a leader, and so on and so forth. So try to, try to mess up the uh, Japanese perspective. But again, what we're going to try to do is penetrate heavy force. Instead of just sending three guys there, we're probably gonna send five guys on this side and that will leave three guys on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, four guys on the other side. We have nine. One guy will be here, at least three guys, and those guys can come here and then just hold the area. You know, if he wants to come, if the Japanese player wants to come this way and play ball, you know, that's fine, but we're going to come here, wait for the Americans, our Americans to clear these guys out by turn three. And then once we reach this position here for the Americans, where we've already established over here, and then we have a couple units here and that are blocked down here. Then we could use our firepower. If anybody is in range, is anybody the line of sight here? We're going to use a couple fire, fire, fire groups, blast those guys, and the other guys can move. And the same thing here. These guys assault, move, advance phase. That's turn four, turn five, and then off the board. And not many guys need to go off the board. Plus, as these guys close the gap. Then they'll take positions up here. The Americans, hopefully there'll be three or four units left. We'll take positions up here. We'll, we'll join up with this group here and then essentially have a wedge if the Japanese units are beaten back this way. And then we just push out. We come to this row, come to this row, and then we end up in this row here to create a wedge, hopefully of American units and then exit a couple guys behind the Japanese line. So that's the concept that we're going to go through for the American plan. You could, you could approach the other direction. You could approach the other direction for the, uh, for the Americans. You know, you could send a large force this way, or you could do piecemeal three, three and three and try to fight it out with the Japanese might be a losing strategy something that you might want to pursue or since there's nobody over here send a whole bunch of units this way and then do like a little blocking force here you could do exactly the same thing but just on the opposite side 
you know, there's a lot more open ground here. You might be able to fire sooner. Like if you're in M7, you can cover most of these hexes here, right? Which might force the Japanese this way. And as you're pushing that way and in, you know, that might be something that you want to consider. You know, if you push the Japanese to this spot here and you have the medium machine gun here, then the medium machine gun can look down this row here quite easily, just sitting there, because he can cover this hex, but not this one. And then the Americans can just push and destroy the, the Japanese from this direction. So something to think about. The only reason why I probably wouldn't want to go this way versus this way is to get up on this hill here. You, you do have the same sort of movement factor impediments here in terms of four. These will cost four to go up. You've only got one spot to go up on two, right? And then two here. And on the backside here, you've got all these hexes here which will cost four to go up as well. So you'll have a lot more. There are no easy way up these locations. That's one turn movement for a squad. So again, that's why you have your leaders is from for mobility before six to get to this location. So that would be something that what you want to might want to think about if that's determining on what side you want to perhaps do your push, your, your invasion and flank around. But I think we're going to take the Americans on the left-hand side, use some firepower at range, try to, try to reduce these units. And then the other units in here, push through the middle. That's something you want to think about. Okay. So that's what we're going to give a try. It may not be the best plan, but we're just going to go with it and see what happens. All right, thanks. Uh, you might wanna, if you want, put down some of your ideas here. If you've played this one before, remember, the scenario is Besieged, S67. Again, I haven't seen a lot of action on this one online, not even uh, passive by watching some units playing SK. Um, haven't seen it. Check it out if you've played it. Let us know how you guys have done. Let us know what your strategies were. Uh, go to the um, ASL Scenario Archive. Maybe they'll have history on it. And a uh, matter of fact, let's go there right now. Let's check out what some of the history might be on this scenario. All right, so uh, typing in ASL Scenario Archive will bring you to our site here. Do a search for either ASL Starter Kit number four or S67 or Scenario Name. It will bring you to the scenario selection here. Here it shows the map, the map that we have. Uh, it doesn't really show that the victory hexes it does show the location. Six turns, nine, five and a half defenders. And look at the data on the right hand side. Uh, the archive shows eight wins for the Americans, five for the Japanese and one draw. I'm not sure how you draw. It's either a win on both sides. Uh, draws are erroneous. Um, one side either wins or loses in this scenario. And then the roar data is four and nine. That data might actually be pretty much just most of it looks like it is coming from the archive because the data is almost exactly the same. And then you've got uh, you've got some replays here. You've got Ramil and uh, Gordon, Japanese win. Uh, oh, here's a solo, American win solo. I'm not sure what's a draw. There's no point in recording that at that point. Americans attacked hard on the Japanese at first. The Japanese skill skillfully withdrew in the jungle, waiting for them along the path. Americans advanced cautiously, which you can't do because you only have six turns. You ran out of time and rushed in the last turn to the exit area, but the Japanese were still numerous. See right there, it's a very passive play. You can't be passive. You've got to go and bust their ass. You've got to essentially eliminate the Japanese from the map or push them out of the area. Uh, Japanese had the balance. The U.S. had one less leader. So what does that do? It reduces your mobility as the American forces. 
The U.S. were cautious in their attack and had poor luck with the IFT. Again, cautious in your attack. You don't have that luxury. You have six turns. The Japanese do not break. They step reduce. So if you break them, you can't just surround them and rout them. They're going to fire back. And you have seven morale. And then the Japanese here, it says, we're able to prevent the U.S. from exiting the required four victory points. And we've got Villas and Matias here. We use the Japanese balance, removed to 8 0 from the American OOB. A collapsing defense combined with a bonsai, where, where the Japanese danced around all the bullets. This was promptly followed by some expert marksmanship uh, for the Japanese at the advancing Americans. The 10 2 went down to a 24 plus 1 fire group and took two of his own squads with him, with four squads and one leader left against an almost equal number of Japanese. There simply wasn't enough time and resources to stop the Japanese from maintaining a presence. This looks like the old uh, stand up in a group and blast the Americans in just one giant solid group. Um, that would probably be sort of like a play testing issue. And, I'll, and uh, we covered that before is just set up in the back. The Americans should come at you, to be honest with you. Um, at that point, if the Japanese are just going to set up units in front of you, then you just advance next to them, let them take a prep fire or not. And then if you break, your 10 minus 2 is not on the front line. You don't need the 10 minus 2 on the front line because all the terrain that you have to deal with is plus 1 for the most part. Use the 10 2 to rally units because you need to get them back in the mix to play the game. So let's go back to the map and we'll see that. Here we are back at the map. And again, you can do something like that to the Americans. You can set up all your Japanese just in this jungle area and then back up, depending how passive the American player is, which he can't be, back up here and then set up some units here because they could all fire group. And then you can back up to this line and then you could back up to this line, and then you could back up to this line. So at that point, you might need to flank them as the Americans flank them this way, so he has to fire in multiple directions. So if the Japanese are defending here, he has to fire here, and if there's a guy here, you want guy at range. But, no, but in no circumstances is your 10 minus 2 in the front if he's going to do stack and retreat defense. 10 minus 2 probably should be sitting right here or right here. Units break on the front line. They go back two hexes. The Japanese are not going to pursue. And the 10 minus 2 needs what to rally a unit when it's DM'd in a jungle as the Americans? What's he need to rally a unit? Well, we got six six sevens, right? Got a six six seven. He breaks. What is his broken morale? He's an American unit. What is his broken morale on the backside? Eight. You're correct. He is in. He's always going to be in the jungle. So that makes it plus one for the jungle, minus two for the leader, plus four for DM status. So this unit DM'd needs a seven to rally. Okay. He needs a seven to rally. You should be able to do that. You should be able to get half your units back up. And again, six, six, seven. What does this unit have? Let's say he moves here and there's a Japanese unit here. What can this unit do to get rid of this concealment in the movement phase? Can that unit get rid of the, can, can this unit get rid of the concealment when they're all stacked up back here? right they're all concealed can this unit remove this concealment without bouncing into him let's say he assault moves here for one can we get rid of that concealment look at the american counter three smoke making capabilities white phosphorus would be a two so if he rolled a two or a one on a smoke placement because assault move is one and then two, three, 
would be the assault movement. If he throws white phosphorus on this unit here, he would be subject to a morale check and then therefore lose his concealment. Now the American can fire in the advanced fire phase if he remains unbroken because most likely you will advance this unit up here Seriously? You will advance this unit up here, assault move right there with concealment. He probably won't fire on you at a six plus one. I mean, he might, but he might not. And then when you drop smoke, that will lose concealment because it's a loss of concealment. But your smoke attempt goes off before his fire. He can't fire on you until after the resolution of your smoke attempt. And at that point, if you roll a one or two, he takes a morale check as a result of his successful smoke placement, and then he can fire. So, but at that point, he will lose concealment. And then therefore, you know, he could fire at you then, or, Maybe he'll break and, and get reduced and so therefore it'll be an eight chart. And then maybe you can assault move a unit, another unit over here that's concealed. And then you could advance in close combat concealed to take him down from that. Okay. And remember in this one here, you can exchange one for one. You know, your exchange rate to the uh, casualties to the Japanese is probably about a 1.5 to 1. So, uh, you can lose a squad and a half to every squad that he loses. And um, you can almost, you could still win the game. Because, guess what? You need four victory points off. That's the 10 minus 2 leader and an 8 zero. That's your four victory points right there. So, if he does, if he does the old boring stack them up, which he could... Then uh, go in there concealed as much as you can. Assault move. Right? Assault move here with a leader. And then you could drop smoke here because that's 2-4. Assault move here for 1. Drop smoke. You can assault move here for 1. Drop and then drop smoke there. Well, that's be 2. So that wouldn't be assault move. But you kind of get the idea. Drop smoke. Try and crack them in areas. And try to bust them in close combat. Or deal with them at range. Stick at range, right? Be further at range so he doesn't get point blank fire. Because if he breaks you, you can always move up further. You know, assuming these guys aren't here. You can shoot this direction. So try it out, and uh, we'll see what happens. We're going to move this unit back up. We're going to move him here. We're going to move him there, right? Yep. All right. So, um, uh, I, again, I think the Americans will move probably five units over here to send a ton of guys up and then three guys up the gut. Or uh, four guys up the gut. Five and then four up the gut. Five should be plenty over here. So, and then four, this will maximize our mobility on these units, even through the dense jungle, because it'll be stacked one, two units. We can get through that dense jungle pretty easily. So, that's what we're going to do. Uh, the positions of these units is not that big a deal. I think we could try to run up the edge over here, because that's a little bit quicker to move. Or we can go straight through the dense jungle, and then push them adjacent. At that point, these units over here might reach this position to cover the open ground that he has to retreat through. So let's give it a shot and see how it works. Use your smoke, use your white phosphorus to generate morale checks. And um, we'll see from there that you could generate a morale check during the movement phase, and then you get to fire at him during the advanced fire phase if you survive. Remember, these have seven morale. You're gonna break a lot faster than our five, 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 five eights Marines or 558 five, Raiders did in the other scenario. Uh, these are considered Raider units, so you're, you're essentially it negates the jungle plus one ambush modifier. All right. Let's hopefully have a good game.
And uh, again, leave your strategies. And if you've played this one here on what you did and what worked well. But uh, ASL Scenario Archive has a good summaries of how, what some people did. Again, you saw how if you moved cautiously, those guys automatically lost. If you use move cautiously, you automatically lose. You only have six turns. If you had eight turns, you can move as cautious as you want. Six turns, you have to move. And that's why they give you four leaders. And that's why the balance is to remove one of the leaders. Because mobility is what the Americans have over the Japanese in this scenario. All right. So let's uh, try our game plans. And let's see how it goes. Go play some ASL, guys, and have some fun.